But, but just you to, know, it seems too like you know you talk about that from right there. They wanted that base. Uh, I don't know. You probably have the anecdotes in your pocket or something. But I would just hazard to guess that with a policy like that, that would preclude the possibility that there's such a thing as a Sino-Soviet split to be exploited, right? Well, it certainly did uh, bring the Chinese and the Soviets uh, together. That the fact the United States was was bent on uh, a sort of regime change in China, which was the official policy, sort of like just just like Iran uh, later on. That certainly forced the Chinese into alliance with the Soviets. A- absolutely, no question about it. And uh, of course, it was as soon as just just as soon as the the prospect of of some sort of uh, Lightening of the pressure on China uh, took shape in the late 1960s, early 1970s, particularly early 1970s. Uh, then the Chinese began to move away from the Soviet Union. So you know this is this is very predictable. Mm. Yeah. All right. Now uh, I'm sorry to divert you too far off the the uh, subject at hand, which is NATO expansion. Which really, you know, we have to at least go back through the 1990s. Pat Buchanan and people like that at the end of the Cold War said, "All right, let's abolish NATO and bring all our troops home from everywhere." And that didn't happen uh, any more than it happened at the end of World War II. And so we went to war. We've been uh, waging, waging war in the Middle East and occupying. But uh, even more than that, we've been buying off governments and making deals and installing bases uh, all throughout the old world. And especially even expanding the war guarantee, the uh, NATO pact, to the Baltic states, some of the uh, actual former Soviet republics, and and so forth. So uh, this leads us up to Georgia. They were planning, right, to bring Georgia and Ukraine into NATO. They were going to try to well, get that done this December. That, that's right. And of course, this is uh, this is not a new policy. It's not a sudden you know shift in policy at all. This was something that they began to talk about internally as soon as uh, Saakashvili uh, took power in 2003. The, the, the Rose Revolution took place. And so, in other words, as soon as they had somebody in power in Georgia who was uh, ready, willing, and able to join NATO, they were right on it. And that became then the default position within the bureaucracy. And I, I cite um, an interview that I had with James Townsend, Jr., who um, was the Pentagon's uh, main official in charge of relations with Europe during this period, and, and he was, of course, involved very heavily in the whole NATO expansion issue. And he told me that, you know, there was great enthusiasm, not only within the Pentagon, but in the State Department, for expansion of NATO right up to Russia's border with this very, uh, not just unruly, but uh, aggressive and historically imperialist Georgian regime Georgian state, I should say, if you're talking about historical, uh, the historical context, in terms of Georgia's relationship with the Ossetians and Abkhazians, who were uh, people, uh, minority peoples, you know, on the Russian border between Russia and Georgia, who who were colonized or, or imperialized by Georgia when they were uh, independent from from Russia in the 1917 and 1921 period. There's a whole history there, but that did not seem to matter at all to the. NATO expansion enthusiasts. I mean, they they were just hell bent on getting this done. One of the things about joining NATO, you have to have all your borders settled and no problems is one of the conditions of joining, right? That is the theory. That that is exactly right. Um, and indeed, I uh, I called the NATO headquarters to ask them precisely this question: Wasn't there concern uh, within uh, NATO members? That uh, membership for Georgia was, in fact, dest- would be destabilizing. That it did not, uh, in fact, fulfill the usual, the normal requirement for NATO membership. That uh, that these kinds of problems should be settled and not be a live uh, issue, uh, remaining to be, you know, something that could explode in the faces of not just the the country itself, but NATO, uh, on, in, in terms of being its uh, partner and uh, sponsor. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, that's true. <laughs> you know, they, they admitted that that was true, and, you know, they didn't really want to comment much further than that. But it was very clear that, uh, you know, there was a great deal of unease on the part of a number of NATO member states, particularly Germany, of course, France and Italy as well, were, were strongly opposed uh, to this idea. And that, that was the case from the beginning. But uh, the Bush administration, and again, with 
the very active uh, and enthusiastic involvement, and I would say even initiative, by the bureaucrats themselves, the ones who were responsible for European relations and NATO relations, they were the ones who were pushing this forward. This is a case, and this is why I think this is such a good story in terms of getting into this broader theme. This is a case where it's not a matter of just the White House or Dick Cheney who are at fault. We can sort of say that it was a kind of conspiracy of a, of a handful of people or, or one or two people in the White House. This is a policy that had broad support within the national security bureaucracy, and that's because, you know, the NATO constituency within the U.S. government is quite large. Uh, it involves, you know, all the people in the Pentagon who have something to do with NATO, uh, as well as people in the State Department who... Uh, who regard NATO as an instrument of U.S. influence in Europe. So there's a much broader problem here, which I think illustrates the point that I would like to continue to hammer away at in the future, which is that we have a big problem with a national security bureaucracy, primarily the military, but also the civilians in the Pentagon, as well as uh, the State Department, who have a vested interest in a whole long list of programs that they are responsible for, that they uh, are involved in day-to-day, -day, which really define who they are as uh, human beings in a way. They sort of define their self-importance by how their programs are doing, whether they're succeeding, whether they prevail or not. And so prevailing uh, in NATO expansion over the Russians became a kind of uh, sort of automatic reflex on the part of the U.S. national security bureaucracy. And they simply refused to face the realities of what that risked in terms of, of war in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Well, now, in your article, you talk about uh, the Clinton administration had, an, had a notion at the beginning that they wanted to bring Russia in to be a partner in uh, post-Cold War European security. They created the NATO-Russia Council and all that kind of thing. But you say that Bill Clinton abandoned that policy, and they decided, no, they were just going to encircle Russia Instead, what was behind that? When did that happen? It happened late in the Clinton administration. Uh, I mean, there were a series of uh, things that, that caused this reaction from the Clinton administration. I mean, one of them was that the Russians became more nationalistic under uh, Putin than they had been in previous, uh, previous regimes in, mm -hmm. in uh, Moscow and, you know, began to have more relations with Iran, more open supportive relations with Iran and Iraq, frustrating U.S. policy in those, uh, in those specific issues, and, and basically being spoilers in a way, uh, being more aware of the, the opportunities that they had and taking advantage of those opportunities to block uh, the more aggressive aspects of U.S. policy in the Middle East, for example. Mm -hmm. So they, they were at least, I guess, entertaining the idea of going ahead and putting the Russians on the dole, too, and making them just another NATO satellite type thing. But well, then, I don't think it was uh, – there was never, as far as I know, any idea that, that Russia was going to be a member of NATO, certainly, or even a uh, somehow, you know, sort of a, a partner, a full partner, uh, as though they were a member of NATO. But there were, there were thoughts certainly being given to the idea – of preventive uh, security ideas that, that would put the primary emphasis on making sure that uh, relations with Russia did not deteriorate into a new Cold War. I mean, that was certainly a very strong tendency within the, the Clinton administration early on. And, you know, the Secretary of Defense, William Perry, was uh, certainly a uh, supporter of that idea. That's one of the things that he had talked about before he went into the Pentagon. So that was a serious uh, thought that the Clinton administration did entertain and, and tried to work on. There was something called the Partnership for Peace that was aimed uh, very strongly at engaging Russia in the security architecture in Europe. And, uh, you know, some of the people involved in that were, in a way, a counter-bureaucratic interest uh, to those who, you know, wanted NATO expansion. Mm -hmm. But then later in the administration, that they began to tip against the uh, those who were strongly supported uh, engagement with Russia, 
and the containment people began to prevail. And, that, and of course, when Bush came into power, that was pretty much a foregone conclusion.